Morning, Councilman. Morning, sir. Thanks for being with us today. Our pleasure. This is exciting. I see our guests are starting to arrive. Thank you all for joining us. I will let everybody get in. We are excited about today's show. If you can see bubbling over, Councilman, I see your, your ready look. Have we have, I, I know you have some tough questions today. We've been getting them all in for a while. Councilman, the other young lady on the with the screen with us is Wendy Napier. She is Assistant Secretary for Real Estate with the Department of General Services. Excellent. Good morning. Good morning. Ask, ask her to join in with us. Um, Secretary is, as they say, down the ocean. Wonderful, wonderful. No, I'm seeing something different on the screen. Oh, the building in the closed captioning. So thank you, Sue. I saw your comment in there and the team was working to make sure we could accommodate. We wanna get started. I know people are still coming in. Just remember this is being recorded, which is great. So you can always go back and look at it, but wanna get started for everyone that joined. I welcome you today. I'm Shalonda Stokes, the president of Downtown Partnership of Baltimore, and I'm excited to be joined as always by Baltimore Councilman Eric Costello. I call him my partner in crime. We are glad you all could join us. We have quite a show for you today. We have the Maryland Department of General Services, Secretary Ellington Churchill and Deputy Secretary Nelson Reichart. We know um, Secretary, just so that you know, was called away by the governor, but he is looking forward to joining us at some part in the show. But not to worry, they are always prepared, as you know. And we also have um, Wendy Scott Napier. She's the Assistant Secretary for Real Estate. So we are in great hands and um, we look forward to the Secretary joining us as well. The Councilman and I look forward to an engaging conversation, but first as always, we have a few updates that we'd like to provide. Uh, wanna shout out Mayor Scott, and the team at Baltimore Development Corporation led by one of our board members, Colin Tarbert, after we know which was a deliberative process, they did select Oakview um, Group and its partner, 35 Ventures, which is led by NBA's superstar, Kevin Durant, to renovate, lease, and manage the Royal Farms Arena in its current location. We know this development team will fully finance the cost of the renovation, and those costs are expected to be about $150 million. This new design will feature glass materials, new lighting, signage, exterior sales, along with the contemporary arena seating, corporate suites, all of the good stuff that you know is in a, you know, a phenomenal arena. And so we're excited about that. We're excited about it staying within the Central Business District, as you all know. Kudos, kudos for that piece. And then another element as you know, we all move to more racial and social equity, what's great about their commitment is 45% minority and women-owned business participation, not only in the construction, but also in the operations. And they also said they reserve at least 25% of the equity for minority investors. So when you talk about the build out and what that does to complement what's happening in the CBD, it's really great stuff there. And so want to shout them out. We know it complements um, the Compass Project, the Super Block, which we're excited to talk about. We have a real estate reception that we're doing with them later today. So all of those great things. And um, for those of you who followed us throughout the BOOST process, BOOST stands for Black Owned and Operated Storefront Tenancy. We have selected our top five our first cohort of boost applicants. And so on July 12th, Mayor Scott will join us um, in Center Plaza as we unveil and highlight them in a media event. So please tune in for that. It's really exciting. We absolutely wanna thank our sponsors and partners of that. Fearless, our title sponsor, BGE and m and Bank. We could not have done that without them. And this is not just about you know, checking a box. This is about helping make our downtown more representative and reflective of the demographics of our city. And we wanna make sure that we're setting those buildings and built businesses up for success. 
And so they will get, as you know, $50,000. They have affordable leases. Thank you to the property owners who worked with us to help make sure that could happen. But more than that, we are building a cohort of support around them to ensure their success. This isn't just get them in the space, but it's helped them thrive. So almost done, Councilman, I'm coming over to you. I do wanna highlight our team, a special shout out to Emily Brighter on our team who is leading the Bromo Arts and Entertainment District. For us last weekend, we had an art walk. If you did not participate, you really missed it. I'm hearing we're gonna do another one, but we had over 525 registrants for that event. It gave me an opportunity to look and see differently. A shout out our operations teams, our safety teams, the area was beautiful. I mean, you can just see the complement of everything working together. And as I round it out, I want to make a challenge to some of you to really come out and join us in Center Plaza and Hopkins Plaza. We're doing lunchtime yoga. We're doing evening workouts. On Wednesday evenings, we have Queen D. I don't know if you've ever had one of her workouts, but I challenge you to do it. It is life changing. And so what's great about it is the residents are coming out and participating in ways that they hadn't before. So all of this information is available on our website, GoDowntownBaltimore.com. Councilman, that's all I'm going to say for now. I know we have plenty to come back and people are on the line because they want to hear what um, Wendy and Nelson are about to tell us. So I'm going to turn it over to you for a few other updates before I come back and intro them. Back at you. Thank you so much, Shalanda. I can't tell you how excited I am about what's going on on the west side with this recent announcement about the arena, uh, the Compass Project that you mentioned. Uh, Shalanda, you and I had an opportunity to tour the Drover's Bank building uh, with a hotel uh, and market rate rental uh, going in there. Incredibly exciting. Uh, Lexington Market, brand new Lexington Market's about to come back online. Uh, and we actually have a ribbon cutting coming up for uh, 410, uh, which is an affordable apartment building on the 400 block of uh, North Utah Street. So a lot of things starting to click in place uh, on downtown's west side. Incredibly exciting. Uh, not many updates on the city side of things. I uh, just want to note for everyone uh, that the mask order will go away on July 1st uh, of this week. And that's pretty much all I got. Back to you, Shalanda. Oh, you kept it nice and short. All right, so we'll get this. You want to get to the question. So good stuff there. You're right, a whole bunch of developments on there. Just want to highlight. So a few months ago, I know you guys probably saw it. Um, Councilman Costello and I were honored, you know, just at the announcement, Governor Hogan, we had state uh, president Bill Ferguson. Um, they came down along with Secretary Churchill to announce the $50 million state funding going towards the state center move. We know that this money will be used to help state agencies relocate um, from state center into the comp into downtown complex towers. Uh, this should be the largest single influx of jobs in downtown's history with up to 12 agencies. And approximately, because we know with COVID, these numbers are shifting though, 3,300 employees. We know that there's a lot that needs to happen between now and then, ribbon cutting, all of the RFP process and all of that good stuff. And so we wanna get the details about that today. That's why we're happy to have Secretary um, Churchill coming on board, Deputy Secretary Reichardt, and then uh, Wendy Napier, Thank you for joining us today. This monumental tax we know doesn't come without ebbs and flows. There have been a ton of questions. We did solicit some pre-questions. And so councilman, I know you will share that with them in the beginning. What I will ask everybody is please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. As always, our process follows. The councilman will start out with some questions and, and we'll get through those. And then we wanna make sure we get to your questions. So please put them in the Q&A box. Coming back to you, Councilman. Thank you, Shalanda. Uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Wendy, thank you so much for being here with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we appreciate what a large and important undertaking this is for Department of General Services, and certainly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. Uh, there's a ton of different elements in play here. So let's kind of start at the 30,000 foot level. Can you talk to us a little bit about what the current conditions are at the state center complex and what's driving the need to move these employees? Sure, thank you. And first of all, thank you to the downtown partnership for inviting us here this morning to, to share in what for us is a major undertaking 
and something that we've been looking forward to doing in a long for a long time. Um, the facilities at State Center were constructed in the late 50s and the early 60s. Uh, the buildings here are old. They suffer from functional and physical obsolescence uh, with much deferred maintenance and all that. The cost of the relife the buildings just makes it uh, financially ineffective. So given the changes in the workforce lately that's been brought about by the pandemic, uh, it presents a perfect time for us to incorporate these modern and updated changes into uh, new and modern efficient workspace for the employees. So it, it is a, an opportune time for us to move forward. So. Thank you. Um, as, as we think about this, you know, in the, in the different roles that different individuals have played, uh, Governor Hogan uh, and our state senator, Senate President Bill Ferguson, uh, have been incredibly visionary about making this move happen. Uh, a few months ago, we had an opportunity to join the governor for uh, his announcement of $50 million to support the move. Can you talk to us a little bit about what those funds cover and what, if any, future support do you anticipate needing in the future? Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, with a move of, of this many people, 30, 3,500 plus or minus people, uh, there's going to be tremendous expenses uh, incurred um, all the way from just moving costs, uh, extra fit up costs that are needed by each maybe individual tenant that are kind of above and beyond the normal. Um, we have, you know, we'll have to go into all the agencies with new, new signage, new printed materials, uh, new, many instances, new furniture and fixtures, equipment, new wiring, uh, updated uh, IT equipment, um, and uh, of course, there will be need for some modifications to parking and parking support. Uh, in addition to that, we still have to uh, we still have to run State Center until everybody's moved out, and so, in a, to a great extent, there will kind of be a double cost, and that we'll be we'll be paying rent for some agencies in commercial space as it's available, and we'll still be operating uh, State Center at the same time. So. Uh, while $50 million sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but with um, something of this magnitude going on, it will, it will be used uh, quite effectively to, to cover all those costs. So, Sh Shalanda, I uh, had a conversation this morning with uh, our other state senator, Senator Antonio Hayes, okay. uh, and I mentioned that the, uh, the secretary unfortunately got pulled into a uh, into a last minute meeting with the governor. Um, and he asked me, well, who was gonna be there? Um, and I said, well, we've got Deputy Secretary Reichart. And he, uh, Senator Hayes, uh, you know, explained very quickly that we had the right person with us. Oh, absolutely. The <laughs> and, and assured me that we're in good hands. So. <laughs> we are, we are, um, we are. So Deputy Secretary, there, there's really no set geography for downtown central business district. Um, you know, commonly referred to it as the CBD. Uh, each um, different, different areas of commercial real estate have different definitions. So it really all depends who you're asking and on which day of the week. What are your boundaries for primary consideration as you think about this move? And right. do you anticipate any agencies that may need to look outside of the CBD? Um, we, we've looked at the boundaries that the downtown partnership uses. We've looked at a one mile radius around uh, the city or around the core area of, you know, the center of Baltimore has always been considered uh, uh, Charles and Baltimore Street. That's been the, you know, kind of the geographic center of, of Baltimore. What we have done, we've looked at uh, the different boundaries that different groups use, and we've kind of followed the partnership uh, uh, definition. But what we've, we've come up to use is basically um, uh, boundaries in our search area will be Martin Luther King to the west, uh, Franklin Street to the north, uh, I-83, President Street to the uh, east, and then Pratt Street to the south. Where, where traditionally buildings, you know, commercial buildings have been located, and it's that core area that we're, we're going to try to focus on. Um, there are Right now, all the agencies will be focused to look in that area 
and agencies may define a specific area within that that they're looking at. And I'm going to use an example. Right now, we uh, I, we put out a, uh, a request for proposals for the Public Defender's Office, um, and they have very specifically defined basically a two to two and a half block area around the circuit court because obviously there's be the, the the people in the Public Defender's Office interact closely with the circuit court. So an agency may define its area slightly smaller within the, uh, the downtown business district to suit its, its specific needs. So I hope that uh, kind of gives an idea of the areas that we will be looking at. Uh, that's, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, how many agencies are we talking about coming into downtown and, and what do you estimate is the number of employees that are involved in this? Okay. Um, first of all, right now we do have a, a request that's been was put on the street about six weeks ago or so for new headquarters for the Department of Human Services. And I believe there are about 700 employees. There have been some multiple responses to that request, and uh, I believe the real estate department now is beginning to, uh, in the next couple of weeks, to look at those responses and begin the evaluation process. So. Uh, that's one group that's really not included in here, but there's about 700 employees that will be coming into the area. Uh, the departments that will be moving in are uh, the Department of Aging, which has about 60 employees, the Department of Budget and Management, which has about 280 employees, uh, the Department of Health, which has uh, 2,500 employees. And I'm gonna say give or take, because in the analysis, they're kind of consolidating some of their uh, smaller offices that are located in the metropolitan area. Uh, the Department of Information Technology has about 25 employees. They're relatively small. Uh, the Department of Labor has a, uh, a thousand employees that are uh, planning to move. The Department of Planning has um, uh, 75 employees. And the State Department of Assessment and Taxation has 206 employees. And, and the big leader of all is the Maryland Tax Court, which has about 10 employees. They're, they'll also be moving into the downtown area. Uh, two agencies that are non-executive agencies, uh, that means they're not underneath the, the governor's office, are the Maryland Comptroller's Office and the Department of Legislative Services. They will be looking for space, but they're independent groups, so they will be doing their own search and their own selection process. Um, I don't have an exact number on the number of people that they have in those two districts. Council, well, if, if um, I could yeah. ask a quick one, a quick question, just to follow up to that. And I know it's one that we've been consistently getting um, on here, but it goes to what you're talking about. I know that you kind of outlined some of what's upcoming. Do you know if there will be, if there's a place that, that people can access or at what point they can know what are all of the upcoming RFPs coming out? Certainly. Um, we have put together a, a sheet called the Frequently Asked Questions about the move of state employees to the Central Business District. And it's a combination of questions that we thought people would ask. And I think you have even provided some questions to us. And if you go to the Maryland Department of General Services, you will see a, um, a series of three pictures that show up there. One right now is the uh, downtown partnerships uh, graphic for this meeting. The second one is this frequently asked questions. Um, and in there are various links uh, that are on the, uh, uh, the, the general services website that connect to the office of real estate. And within that office of real estate page, there are all of the RFPs will be listed there as well as in the daily record and on email and marketplace advantage, which is called Emma. And there's a link there also to tie into Emma, which we suggest everybody who's interested in responding, uh, sign up for Emma so that you get the latest updates. And uh, there again, all of our standard specifications, our lease form, uh, our requirements, our RFPs that we're putting out for space, everything is listed on our website. So. Um, in, and included in there are also phone numbers for uh, 
uh, Wendy Napier's office that they can call if they have specific questions. So we've really tried to get as much information out to the public as possible. No, truly appreciate that in the partnership. We don't take that lightly um, in here. And so thank you all for working with us in that process. Sorry, Councilman, what, periodically may jump in just because some of them are aligned. No, no problem. Uh, Deputy Secretary, as you'll quickly find out, Shalanda and I got a, a good tag team thing going here. So, um, so like all businesses coming out of the pandemic, uh, in the state of Maryland is no different. Uh, still trying to figure out how to balance uh, telework and in-person staffing. Uh, ultimately, that's gonna affect the amount of real estate space each agency is going to need. Uh, it also impacts uh, how much parking to plan for, uh, equipment to purchase, such as desks, chairs, et cetera. How are you working through all of those considerations? And what are really the big unknowns that you're currently dealing with? Okay, um, well, First of all, because we move into this uh, activity fairly quickly, um, we are going to be putting out the RFPs for each agency independent, individually, uh, not as a group. We're putting them out one at a time. Uh, we're working with each agency because each agency has different needs and requirements. So we're, we're working with each agency. Um, we have over 4 million square feet under commercial lease. So we're a pretty, pretty big tenant in the state of Maryland. And as such, we, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a process to evaluate the needs of an agency. Um, we have, uh, through consultants, tried to incorporate some of the latest changes in office space. And Wendy has been working with her staff and with the agencies to develop the new requirements that are going out in, uh, in the request for proposals so that when we do go out, we're trying to use the latest technology and the latest design and requirements that are needed. Uh, Wendy, if there's anything that you wanna to add to that? Um, I would just add Nelson that, that we most recently updated our space standards um, to try to be more efficient in the new RFPs, and those are posted on our website. Um, if any interested parties would like to look at those. Um, Thank with, you. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that with respect to parking, uh, we have, because of the number of uh, occupants that we have in the Central Business District, we have uh, some parking leases as we begin the move and begin to find out where our, the tenants are gonna be located, we are going to begin adjusting our, our parking policies uh, and, and needs to reflect uh, teleworking, uh, people that are there every day, locations and all that. So parking is gonna be a little bit of an afterthought once the dust begins to settle, so to speak, on uh, where everybody settles in. Thank you. Um, so Deputy Secretary, in addition to um, modernizing offices, um, this is obviously an opportunity for state agencies to take advantage of some of the amenities uh, that exist in the Central Business District, uh, whether it's world-class uh, gyms and fitness facilities, um, food options, uh, et cetera, um, and continued access to public transportation. State Center is obviously very rich uh, in public transportation options, uh, as is the Central Business District. Are those amenities things that are going to be factored into each RFP moving forward? Um, our, the RFPs that we issue, the evaluation is both the technical and a financial aspect to it. Obviously, the financial aspect is certainly a very, very important part and plays a critical role in, in, in defining who is the successful, or at least it appears to be the best uh, offer, best value for the state. However, there is a technical part where uh, the, I'm gonna say the more intangible or non-financial issues are evaluated and given consideration. So it does play, they will play a part in the evaluation, yes. Wendy, if there's anything that, um, we should add to that I did in the valuation process. Um, I think one thing we should discuss, Nelson, is that our broker um, is CBRE, 
and they will be walking through the uh, request for proposal process with us. And as such, um, they will be a strong partner in working with interested landlords uh, who submit proposals. Um, so as proposals are coming in, as, as Nelson said, we do have a defined evaluation process. Um, and our broker team will be working with landlords to respond to questions, um, to help understand um, what the most critical evaluation criteria are. Um, I know we have historically used um, public transportation um, being near transit-oriented development as one of our criteria. So that is important to us, which being downtown, um, we anticipate almost every location will be in close proximity. Um, so those are some of the some of the things that we will be looking at. Thank you. <clears throat> so when we talk about uh, this upcoming move, um, is there is there any clarification on what the general time frame is going to be before we see all the moves completed? Are we talking two years? Are we talking five years? What are your thoughts, Deputy Secretary? Um, the typical commercial lease acquisition process for runs, <clears throat> excuse me, for us, runs about 12 to 15 months um, from the time we issue the request for proposals until we have approved leases, which means the leases are presented by to the Maryland Board of Public Works, which is the governor, comptroller, and treasurer. Every commercial transaction is presented to them for their approval and signature. We hope to have all of the approvals from the board um, or the projects presented to the board by the end of summer uh, in 2022. So that's probably 15, 16 months from now. After that approval, we then begin the final design, the fit out, the build out of the space, construction, and the actual move in. So the entire process from the issue of the RFP uh, until a tenant actually move in usually falls within that 18 to 24 month period. So uh, as we begin to issue these RFPs over the next several months, that, that 18 to 24 month cycle will begin. And so we're looking to have everybody leases signed or leases approved, you know, sometime in the, in the, in the end of uh, 22 and into construction. Thank you. And when we think about the current state center site, um, Deputy Secretary, you may not know this, but that's also in the, the council district that I represent in the 11th. Um, there's been a um, there's been a long push for for a long period of time by the community uh, to get that site uh, redeveloped uh, in a in a manner I think that is consistent with the community vision for that area. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why Senator Hayes had uh, legislated I, I want to say about two sessions back to ensure that the community was involved as we start to reimagine plans for, for what that site could be. Can you talk a little bit about the status of, of the current site um, and any plans that may be on the horizon for it? Okay, sure. Well, obviously we're gonna be continued to house here until everybody moves out, which is gonna be, you know, maybe another 24 months. Uh, the National Guard, the 5th Regiment Armory will be here. That's going to stay. Um, <clears throat> Right now, we haven't laid any specific plans for this because it, this is the subject of an ongoing litigation uh, from a prior developer. And until that litigation is resolved, <clears throat> we can't really make any specific plans. But uh, I will say that in 2018, we partnered with uh, the Maryland Stadium Authority and the Stadium Authority issued a uh, request for expressions of interest. Uh, about this, the campus. And <clears throat> at that time, eight, uh, say, mid-Atlantic developers came in and expressed an interest in the uh, possibility of a mixed-use redevelopment of the state center site. So we know that there's interest out there. We know that given the size of the campus as 20 or 25 acres, that, you know, it has the ability to be a mixed-use site with, you know, some office, 
certainly uh, residential, mixed use residential, either ownership, uh, affordable housing, uh, some retail. So it's a big campus and it certainly has the, the you know, the uh, ability to be, to serve as a, a good redevelopment site. We've looked at some other sites in different cities that are similar. And basically that's what they've been able to do with, with those large tracks has come up with, you know, mixed use redevelopment. So we're excited about the future of it as well. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly, um, you know, excited about what we're talking about in downtown and uh, certainly um, anticipating and, and hopeful for um, something to happen at, at State Center that's, that's consistent with the community vision for, for Midtown. Um, Shalanda, I know we've got a ton of great questions coming in in the q and I'm going to turn it over to you for some, some great questions from our audience. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, some of the questions, which are great, um, you guys answered along the way. So I'll highlight. So Linda, thank you for your question on the timeline of this project. I know that we answered that. Nelson just answered that one. So thank you on that. Sue Carlin um, is asking a question about the percentage and, and Wendy, maybe this goes to what you were talking about just with the transit access, but she's asking if we know what percentage of state workers moving to the CBD actually use public transportation. And Shalanda, that is one piece of information that we're working through with our state agencies as we're meeting with them and defining their new space needs. We're asking them to help us understand um, who uses public transportation, uh, how many of their staff will be teleworking in the future. So those are details we're working out now. So we don't have any numbers for you today. Okay, but thank you. And please, I think what's great and, and Sue and team, just everybody on here, what's exciting about just how close we've been in partnership on this is as we get information, we'll continue to push it out. And what I would ask anybody else that's on here, this is, act, we really want this to be two way. This is evolving as um, Deputy Reichart mentioned, you know, this process happened pretty quickly. And so we're kind of building as it goes, which, which offers some flexibility within it too, in the structure. So this is great. Any information that you guys have that you also wanna feed in, please continue to do that with us. And we'll also make sure that that gets to the team there as well. Um, this question coming from Ed is a little bit different. This is one of the borderline questions. It's, is the Camden Yards being a warehouse office building, one of the buildings that can receive tenants from state center? Given the governor's directive of working in the central business district, we're trying to focus towards commercial buildings, um, you know, rather than state-owned facilities. Um, we, are, uh, we, we are going to be doing uh, one redevelopment, and that is for the offices of Department of General Services, since we're the real estate agent for the state and also manage buildings. We're going to actually be redeveloping one of our own facilities for our, for our use because we're our needs are a little different than most agencies in that we have a lot of equipment um, and we have a, uh, we have a complete uh, canine unit that we have to house. So we're looking to redevelop one of our sites, but we're trying to focus on non-state owned facilities, if at all possible for the relocation of people from state center. Perfect, thank you. That kind of ties into Ed's question next, which uh, are the state and city owned buildings in general part of the program? Well, they're, they're certainly for us they are because they're the city state owned buildings are the ones that we manage and maintain. Um, but you know, our focus, like I say, with this project is going to be more towards the commercial side as opposed to state owned, you know, buildings. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, this one, James, I know we got to that question, which is his was about the plans for the redevelopment of State Center. And I, and I know you guys are getting this question often. Part of what I know we've been hearing consistently is we don't want to take from one area to help another. And so just um, Deputy Reichardt, I just want to thank you for your thoughtful response to that. This isn't about pulling from and leaving, you know, an area desolate. And so it's everybody figuring out how there is some continued investment and development in that area. So thank you for your answer there. Um, 
Janet Allen. Hey, Janet asked a question about how many and what buildings downtown are under consideration for this. I know you may want to answer within the boundaries, but I'll let you answer that one. We're going to put out an RFP and there again, you know, any building within the boundaries that has good commercial office space available is what we would be interested in. Um, we've given the boundaries before, you know, uh, Martin Luther King on the west, I-83 on the east, Franklin Street, and down as far as Pratt Street. Uh, they're the areas where we consider to be the concentration of uh, viable commercial office buildings that we could be, uh, could be attended in. So that's the areas that we're looking at. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to go to Ed's question because we're talking still within the border, but he's asking, is the Metro West complex eligible? It's on the northern border on the inside. It's on it's on the border of uh, Martin Luther King. So it's within the boundaries. Uh, a built, you know, every, every building within the boundaries, if it's a, if it provides all of the necessities that the agency needs, it can be considered. Perfect, thank you. This one shifts a little bit from Matthew asking, it says the state has set aggressive goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. How is sustainability factored into the selection of new facilities? Well, that becomes, you know, I guess part of the evaluation that we would look at with, um, with evaluating each individual site. Uh, what has that individual landlord done? How effectively have they, uh, aggressively have they gone to, towards a sustainable building? Uh, we're certainly looking for, uh, uh, you know, transit use to reduce uh, pollution, vehicular pollution. Uh, Wendy, if there's any specifics that you can think of off the top of your head that we're Yes, um, two things to add, Nelson. Um, the first is that in all of our lease facilities, um, even in, when we're renewing a lease, uh, we work with a landlord to ensure that they are using the most up-to-date, energy-efficient features in the building with lighting, um, with everything um, infrastructure-wise. The second aspect is that the state is very much moving forward with EV charging. And we anticipate um, ensuring that many of the par new parking spaces that we'll be procuring uh, will be EV charging compliant. Thank you um, for that. So, so is there, as we're looking at the buildings, is there a preference? Is there anything, whether it's class A or class B buildings, we're looking to move into both? It can be, you know, it, Every realtor, a real estate agent, can, defines Class A and Class B a little bit different. Uh, uh, certainly, you know, if you think of everything at the Harbor East as Class A, you know, built within the last three or four years, five years, that's one thing. We're looking in the commercial, uh, you know, in the downtown business district. Um, there are some very great buildings down there. There are some that, you know, are small and, and, and are inefficient and uh, some that are good. That's what we're, we're going to be looking to see what is the best value for the state. No, perfect. So this may be a stumper. I think Ed is is uh, committed to stumping us today. But he, but this one, can a new building be constructed within the boundary? Could a new building be constructed within the boundaries? Uh, it could be. The biggest issue would be in our analysis. Uh, what is the time frame that it could be? I don't believe we want to run uh, state center, continue to operate state center for four or five years until a new building is up and running and satisfied. Uh, that, that would be a little bit counterintuitive to what we're trying to do, I believe. But, you know, certainly if there is a newer building that meets the criteria at best value for the state, sure. Thank you so much. Um, we have one from Frank that talks about, that asks if there'll be opportunities for Baltimore City interior design space planning firms to assist in the planning and design um, of the new facility locations. 
once we select a particular building, it is the landlord's responsibility to provide the design and construction of the interior. So we really don't have an input into the firm that does the interior design. We, we certainly would like to support them to the extent that we can, but it's up to the individual landlord because it's, it's on his dollar to you know, provide the space as, as required. We do have a process where we meet with the, uh, the designer and look at the plans as they're evolving till we're excited, till we're, they're acceptable. Okay, perfect. So, so you talked a little bit earlier about sort of the formula evaluation process, almost like if there's some sort of rubric. Um, one of our questions coming up next is, and I don't know, you can give the exact, but how much weighting um, is given to the rental rates in the evaluation? I know you talk about best value. I'm not, you know, intricately familiar. I'm going to ask Wendy if she is familiar. I think there are some criteria in there, but exactly, and they're, I don't know whether they're that fixed or not in terms of value. So Wendy? Yes, um, that question is, is a very timely question. And the price component in the RFP does carry the most weight. Um, it is not the final say, however, we, we do need to ensure that any special requirements that an agency has, such as first floor retail space, um, if it's a specific location, such as need, needing to be near the courthouse, we need to make sure um, that we hit those other targets as well. But I will confirm that price is the largest consideration in the evaluation process. Perfect. Thank you. I know that that's a big one that we've been getting. I know the other question asked about the Social Security building. I think they're talking about Metro West. And I know that you already answered that question that that does fall within the boundaries. A couple other ones that I know we've been getting, and this is this one has been um, asked quite often. I know it's probably in your FAQs as well, but are the larger agencies, to your um, understanding, willing to spread out across multiple buildings and if that's the case can you know some of our building owners partner on rfp re response to attract a larger agency yeah the, certainly uh, if if there's uh the ability of uh if if there isn't a sufficient amount of space or if two landlords you know team together or two building owners team together and present a proposal that meets our criteria for one of the large rates because we do know that you know these two agencies are pretty substantial and are going to require you know a large amount of space. So yes, it's very possible, and we certainly will consider uh, will consider that as in the analysis in our valuation that we could have a partnership of two um, of two uh, two uh, two buildings, and we'd also be not opposed to putting two agencies in one building. We have buildings downtown now, commercial buildings that have more than one uh, one state agency in it. No, which is which is great. Um, as as you know, we've we're doing a lot in the CBD around really ensuring safety and walkability and all of those things. Ground level retail really helps create that kind of experience. Do you know if any of the state agencies that are moving in are also looking for uh, ground level retail in the spaces? Um, we are, that is one of the things being considered in uh, the evaluation or the workup for each agency and for the RFP. Do they need uh, a first floor presence where people can walk in off the street and transact business with the state? There are some agencies that, uh, that will require that and would like to have that uh, ability so that people can walk in transact business, much like they do with the MTA now at uh, 6 St. Paul Street to go in and buy monthly passes and so forth for transit. We, we do have agencies that will be looking for some first floor space. Thank and you. that'll be part of the RFP request. Got it. Thank you so much. Have one question coming from one of our board members. Hello, Alexa. Um, the question- hey, Shalanda. Sure. Hey, sorry to interrupt. We've been joined, I think, by Secretary Churchill. Oh, good. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Sorry, I'm joining late. I'm here, of course, in Ocean City at the MML conference, but uh, with technology, uh, we're able to join from many different places. So um, I'm, it's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, I'm glad that uh, you had two great experts, much more knowledgeable than I am. <laughs> In terms of uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Reichert and uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Scott Napier on, on the line. So, pleasure to join you. No, thank you for joining us. We, I mean, I guess the governor can usurp downtown download. That's one of the only ones that we will accept, you know, in here. But no, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Your team has been amazing, as, as we know. Um, we're coming down to some of the ending questions um, in here. And so, if you will join with us, we have a couple more questions, but I would, before we get to those, if there's anything, I think high level that you can share just about your excitement and, and you know, some of how this transpired. I know you guys have been very intricate. You've been amazing partners in the work. So if there's anything you'd like to overall share before we get to the final questions, please. Sure. Well, this, this vision uh, of uh, having to, uh, the opportunity of moving agencies out of state center has been um, at uh, a priority for the administration from, from day one. And it presents a new opportunity in terms of how government services can be um, um, spread around uh, for our, our, our different agency missions and our different agency clientele. So really it is an opportunity for a new day um, in this 21st century to, um, to deploy services. So, and to be able to impact uh, the downtown Central Business District in such a meaningful way to provide better uh, services, better amenities for our state employees, which they richly deserve, uh, is uh, presents a great opportunity that will have uh, a lasting effect on our on our workforce for generations to come. So uh, that's the opportunity, and we look forward to um, having a great deal of success in moving our agencies uh, into the Central Business District. Thank you so much. I was actually getting to a question from one of our board members, um, Alexa. She's asking, um, and, and maybe Nelson, this was to your question, your comment earlier, but can you share a bit more about your canine unit and what you'd be looking for regarding space? Would you need any space, you know, downtown potentially for that team? There, the, our canine team right now is the, we have three, three canine uh, dogs that. Uh, we provide space for, you know, a kennel space. And so they're in and out of the building here and there uh, doing their work. Um, we also have a police, uh, you know, a full police force um, that we need to house there with, you know, facilities for them. So that's the reason we've, you know, opted to, to redevelop a building that we already own because we can provide that plus the storage that we need for uh, equipment and so forth around. Um, if I can uh, go back to one question you were beginning to touch on was uh, safety mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, one of the um, keys in the last legislative session is that the, um, the Maryland Capitol Police have now uh, received from the legislature expanded boundaries for their areas of responsibility. Not only are they responsible, but for the safety of uh, the state campuses, but they've been expanded now that they can provide their service to any state leased facility, whether it's in downtown Baltimore, Baltimore County, out of Rundle, wherever, they have jurisdiction now in leased facilities as well. So um, it's an important factor for us as we begin this process. Absolutely. Thank you for making sure we got that in and we know safety is primary. And as you all know, we've been even at Downtown Partnership engaging in increased safety and security efforts to ensure, you know, just all of downtown. So we have layered on top of our traditional um, security, some Baltimore City School police officers and some Maryland State police officers and looking at other innovative ways to make sure we increase the walkability in this area. So thank you for that. Leaning on safety though, we have a question. This is a little shift, but it's asking if there are any special security concerns or issues with mis mixing private tenants and state tenants. Um, we have right now, we have a number of buildings in downtown Baltimore that have 
uh, state agencies in them. Uh, there's some on Redwood Street, some right along Charles Street that actually have state agencies as tenants in there. We work fine with the landlords to, to coordinate our activities and security or whatever within the buildings. All through the pandemic, we've worked very, very comfortably with, um, with our landlords. Uh, Wendy, anything more that you can think to add to that? Uh, I agree with you, Nelson. We, we have been in multiple buildings um, in the city and other areas uh, with com other commercial tenants, and it's always been a positive experience. Great to hear on there. Um, another one, hey, Ben, another one of our board members is asking um, just for clarification around the timetables. We mentioned, too, there's an RFP to the Board of Public Works um, timetable in there and then the um, actual timetable for getting them in there. Can you clarify? Well, it, there's a, as we said before, it's we look at about a 12 to 15 month period from the time we issue a request for a proposal and then we get the responses back, analyze the responses, maybe talk to each individual respondent about their facility, go and inspect it, uh, select the one that feels is the best value, try to negotiate a lease with that particular property owner or landlord, then take that approved lease or agreeable lease to the Board of Public Works and get the board's approval to it. After that approval was obtained, then we begin the process of working with the landlord on the actual interior design of the office space, the construction, acceptance, and then final move in. So it's, it's a multi-step process that, like I say, overall takes from 18 to 24 months. We're hoping to, you know, we try to get the thing, uh, the approved agreements to the Board of Public Works in a period of about 12 to 15 months. And that allows, you know, some three to six months to one build out, depending on the nature of the build out and what has to be done. Great, thank you. You guys, I'm just telling you the questions are coming in. So this is a hot topic. Um, this one coming coming back from Janet, who will be evaluating the RFPs and making the decision about which buildings to choose? Will the state employees or community members be involved in that process? Wendy, I'll leave you. Yes. Because it falls so, into your unit. So this uh, process falls under uh, COMAR provisions regarding uh, procurement processes. So the evaluation team is composed of the state agency that is moving, um, the Department of General Services, the procurement officer and other staff um, in our lease management group and our commercial broker team. So those entities compose the evaluation process. And because it is such a um, governed process, I'll say, through COMAR regulations, um, we have to keep the proposals confidential and keep that information close while we go through a thorough evaluation process with our team. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, there is this, it's a hot topic around where you guys are moving. So it's where you're, where you do where DGS is located. So they're asking the address of the DGS uh, renovation. Uh, for a number of years, EC, did you want to chime in? I saw you begin to move. Sure. I, 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 this is, uh, this has been an opportunity that has been looming for us. We've been looking for a way to reposition the 2100 Guilford Avenue building, which, used to house our uh, public safety parole and probation offices. It's in the, um, the central uh, Baltimore neighborhood of Barclay. And it's a perfect uh, a building uh, for us because of its uh, central location and uh, of the uh, amount of space that it has to, uh, to provide uh, for all of our six divisions, the special needs that we have as well as additional needs uh, for, for other state uh, agencies um, in a similar manner to what's being provided at, at, at State Center. So 2100 Guilford, and um, uh, the building has a very long history, uh, and uh, we look forward to bringing our um, professional department along with our architects and engineers and uh, facilities folks and our police force uh, to this uh, uh, this new capital uh, project uh, for the department. 
Thank you so much. Uh, are there any specific agencies to you guys' knowledge that need to be together or directly adjacent? Um, we're still looking at, you know, we're still meeting with each individual agency and trying to see if their connections are together. Um, the Department of In Information Technology has expressed an interest to be closely located to the biggest core of uh, state employees because they're the ones that provide the daily service of, you know, going out when somebody has a computer problem, they have to send someone out to fix it. Or if there's a, an IT problem in a building, they're the ones that go out to, to, uh, to do it. So they've expressed an interest in wanting to be in close proximity to the greatest concentration of state offices. Uh, other than that, there's, there are some connections, but not a tremendous amount of tight connections between agencies. Perfect, thank you. And our last question, we're gonna to have to cut it off now, but it's, this is actually a question, not just for you guys, and I know it's a part of the process that's really you know, making sure it's thoughtful around what we're doing post COVID, but it's, is the state adopting a work from home strategy um, in there that's you know going to taking into account some of the considerations and if so um are there or is there an overall sense or percentage of what amount of people will be working from home well the department of budget and management has uh, come up with an overall policy for the state in terms of our, our telework and, and the state workforce uh, safe to say the, uh, this year and three months of COVID have certainly realigned uh, our ideas of what uh, telework can, can, how telework can benefit our respective agencies. And so, yes, that will be a part of the overall considerations as we move forward. And that's part of the reason why our, our, our process has been delayed because uh, we had to go back uh, with each individual department and look at their individual needs. Every department, it's not a, it's not a one size fits all. As an example, general services, about 50% of our workforce uh, uh, can utilize uh, some uh, part of telework where the other 50% are essential personnel and need to be uh, on, our, on our sites um, uh, on a daily basis. And each, uh, and each agency will, are making those decisions uh, now. Uh, in answering those questions from the Department of Budget and Management. So we are working with the Department of Budget and Management and uh, every other agency to, um, to analyze those, uh, those results. And uh, so safe to say, as a part of the opportunity that I mentioned uh, to reposition government, telework is a part of that. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, we're looking at hoteling uh, as, as a part of uh, of, of, to be able to keep a nimble workforce. So within an agency, there is an opportunity to, to have some set aside for, uh, for other agencies who are outside of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the city to, to come in and, and, uh, and, and do work on, a, on an as needed basis. So it's a great opportunity uh, to one, attract uh, a, you know, the, uh, the future comers of, uh, of, of state government, of, of public servants who, who actually are looking for that type of flexibility in their work plan. So thank you. Way to close it out. Thank you so much, Secretary, for joining us. Deputy Reichart, tremendous. Thank you for, for holding down the fort while he wasn't, you know, while he was uh, aligned with the governor and Wendy. Very nice um, for your input. We look forward to staying connected. I don't want you guys to think by any thought that we take this lightly, the partnership, the process of even getting here. This is the important catalyst that we needed in the Central Business District. And so we value the partnership and look forward to really moving some of these things forward. I think some of the questions you were getting about the timeline was because we, we needed this and we need it now. Going pre-COVID, but COVID you know, elevated kind of the need for it. So thank you so much to that. Councilman, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to say a couple of things before we just close it officially. I think you're muted, Councilman. 15 months worth of Zoom as you figure <laughs> out, I, I probably figured out how to use the, the unmute button at this point. Mr. Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary, and Wendy, thank you so much for being here. Shalanda, it's great to have a guest on the show named EC. 
uh, like myself. So wonderful exactly. to see you again, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and, and appreciate all the collaboration. Back to you, Shalanda. Yep. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all once again. Thank you to all of the attendees. You tuned in and came out strong. I appreciate it. Thank you to my board chair, Mark Wasserman, and several board members that I saw on here, several partner organizations. You guys continue to, to help us strong. And please let us know if there are other topics you want to see. To my team, Mike and Nicole, we could not do this without you. Lauren and also downtown partnership team rocks. Please, you know, this will be recorded, as I said earlier. So if you missed any part of it or any of our other webinars, you can go to our website, go downtown Baltimore to check it out or meet us on social. Thank you all and have an amazing day. Thank you for helping us get the message out. Thanks. Thank you.